Chapter 17 I say Jean Noel just happened to fall under the spell of the migratory legend out there on the high seas. Happened to me once, and that didn't put the fear of the Lord you right quick nothing will. This was Chris O'Keefe's overall assessment of Jean Noel's strange experience while out kayaking at Lover's Point in Pacific Grove as it was retold to him by the extremely worried Alice. Gwen, at that moment, appeared in the garden bearing an ample tray of sardine sandwiches for her guests, even as she was being tailed aggressively by Bartholomew, who never failed to follow closely on the scent of Dr. Cordero's erstwhile favorite luncheon. It can only be surmised that the lunch stirred up pleasant memories in the, the prescient tabby cat of the good doctor and his wife, Blanquita, with whom the cat had spent his youthful salad days. Subsequently, it had become a luncheon favorite of the younger white cat, Blaze, who often took his cues from the older, wiser Bartholomew, or simply Mew, as he was known by close associates. As for Vivaldi, it must be noted the sardine was something of an acquired taste, and like so many tastes acquired in this life, sometimes against our own better judgment, a surfeit of them had been known to wreak havoc on the pug's sensitive digestive system. Help yourselves, Gwen urged her guests. I'll be right back with lemonade. Don't mind if I do, Christy said as he genteelly passed the tray to Elspeth and to Alice first. Okay if I feed some of these here pilchards to the critters? Of course, there's plenty for all, Gwen called over her shoulder, just before passing through the French doors en route to the kitchen. She turned on her heel to add thoughtful admonition. Go sparingly with Vivalde, please. He likes them far too much for his own good, and I'm afraid they don't seem to really like him that much at all. Ah, see, Christy said as he nodded comprehendingly and reached down to pat the pug in question on the small, velvety dome of his head. That sounds a lot like the story of my life, too, little feller. Loving too much can be a real hurtful thing he said wistfully, but not without a nostalgic twinkle in his eyes. Alice, meantime, had not eaten her sandwich with anything approaching the ribald gusto shared by the two cats whom Christy had given one entire sandwich apiece. Afterward, he seemed to produce, through sleight of hand, a milk-bone biscuit from out of the thin air, and then, with a flourish, bestowed on Vivaldi along with a knowing wink. Alice's sandwich had gone for the most part untouched as she continued to struggle in her mind to find a plausible excuse that would explain Jean Noel's un the other worldly experience at sea. Curious to learn more of Christie's rather odd-sounding theory on the matter, she prodded him further by saying, I'm afraid I, I don't know what you mean by migratory legend. Happy enough to shed light on the oft-understood subject, Christy O'Keefe explained, it's something important what happened in the world a long time ago, and the memory of it's been sort of floating around in the air ever since. There's been so many people who've been repeating that story over and over for thousands of years that it's kind of taken a life of its own. While the names may keep changing with every telling, the meaning of the story is always the same. That's what's called a migratory legend. So, Alice wondered aloud, not without a trace of skepticism, who in the world is this king of cats? Well, Christy answered handily, that ain't hard to figure out now, is it? I'd say in a euphemism, if I ever heard one of things about the great god Pan. Pan? Alice echoed back incredulously, finding Christy's logic to be growing fuzzier by the minute. Of course, Pam here assured her, with its studied patience, the god of nature, darling. Why, if he's considered to be the king of all things wild, wouldn't he also be considered the king of the cats? After lunch, it was decided that Alice would drive Elizabeth over the basement apartment to the Sovereign Hotel to visit with the still not fully recovered Jean Noel, who continued his prolonged recuperation on the sofa bed in Alice's living room. Bartholomew and Blaze mutually decided to remain behind in the garden for an extra afternoon nap in the sun. Vivaldi? chose to walk reverentially, several paces behind his new idol, 
Christy McMahon, who in turn elected to follow Gwen into the kitchen to help with the washing up. Once there, Christy, like a magician, produced yet another milk bone biscuit seemingly from out of thin air for the grateful pug who wagged his tightly curled tail to the best of his ability in appreciation. Although Hound is credited with being quicker than the eye, it was true that Christy, indeed, had concealed nothing up his sleeve. Gwen's eye was able to detect the source of the milk bone biscuits as coming from the inside pocket of Christy's tweed waistcoat. So what kind of dog? Gwen asked with a reproving smile. Do you have Mr. O'Keefe? <laughs> oh, ain't I had a dog in over 20 years, darling. Loving a dog is one of them real hurtful things in life we talked about earlier. It's just too painful when it's either time, uh, they are time to go. Well, what kind of dog did you have, if I may ask? Gwen queried gently. Oh, I had me a big old dog, Christy readily obliged. Not like this one here. No offense, little fella. My dog was kind and calm and loyal, and he was a powerful swimmer. I had him, he had him a thick, oily coat and even webbed feet, if you can believe that. So he didn't have to doggy paddle when he swam. Dang, if that dog didn't know how to do the breaststroke. You see, his kind was bred to save lives at sea, and many were the lives that dog did save in his day. And what happened to your dog, Gwen found herself asking, as if she'd forgot all about doing the dishes and put the kettle on for tea instead. Well, as fate would have it, I wound up in the hospital for a few weeks, and a friend of mine was taking care of him for me. During that time, my friend grew real attached to that dog. When I finally got out of the hospital, the two of them had bonded mighty strong. Eventually, she had to go back to France, where she was from, and dang if she didn't want to take my dog with her. And you let her? Gwen asked with surprise as she poured tea into both of their cups. I had to, Christy avowed, solemnly as he poured cream into his own cup. But why, Gwen demanded in disbelief, inconceivable as such a notion was to her higher instincts, because my friend was in need of that dog more than I did. She was going through a real tough time, and that dog was the only thing getting her through it. Now, I ain't saying I was happy about it or nothing. I just know in my heart that what I had to do, and so I'd done it. By the way, Christy briskly injected, as he quite obviously intended to steer the conversation off to the still painful subject. I hear this funeral's waiting on Jean Noel's grandma to get here from Paris. Do you know when that's likely to happen? Late tonight, Gwen informed him as she suddenly pushed the box of tissues Christie's direction across the kitchen table. Natalie's husband is picking her up at the airport. Oh, so Natalie's here already, is she? Christie said, taking a tissue and dabbing the corner of his eye. Christie, Gwen startled, at quietly after an awkward pause. Natalie's dead. Zuzu's coming from Paris. Zuzu? Christian reiterated as he cocked his head in consternation. Now correct me if I'm wrong, darling. Maybe my brain is just odd at like Jean Noel's, but I could have sworn on a stack of Bibles that they said it was the boy's mama what died. She did, Gwen answered sympathetically. I think you're just getting their names confused. Natalie is Jean Noel's mother. Zuzu is his grandmother. I see, was all that Christy O'Keefe said as a realization about his father. He'd never been told the truth about anything at all.